I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk. Yep. He's intoxicated with himself. Most likely. Sober him. Light now, Francis. Francis. <laughs> I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, a weekly theological podcast where we sit down at the kitchen table and we talk about theology. Lutheran Lemonade, to gladden the heart of man. So on this episode of Lutheran Lemonade, we're going to talk about the effects of social distancing on the Christian church. And we're going to look at... uh, Matthew eighteen twenty, Jesus saying, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Because this is being used as an excuse to not go to church. Now, I'm not going to talk about whether or not Christians should be going to church or whether or not we shouldn't be. I'm not a pastor. It's not my place to decide what an individual congregation should do. But I'm going to talk about a bad argument. If you don't want to go to church because you want to social distance and maybe you take the stance that many do, that it is in love and service to my neighbor that I not go out to public places and gather with a lot of people because that could contribute to spreading the coronavirus, that is a matter of conscience, okay? So I'm not going to judge, but... We do need to talk about this verse that that countless people on social media are using to justify why they shouldn't go to church. But before we get to that, where can you find Lutheran Lemonade? Well, you can find it at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade every Thursday evening and given uh, the coronavirus pandemic and being that I'm a father uh, who works 40 hours a week and now has to homeschool my child, my schedule is crazy busy. Uh, And this is actually attempt number two because the video camera for Lutheran Lemonade podcast on YouTube on Friday evenings didn't record the first episode, so I have to do the whole thing over again. That's okay. I poured myself another beer, and we are good to hook. Now, you can also find Lutheran Lemonade on YouTube at 1517 Films, where you see the 1517 in the circle and the word films below. That's the logo. Check it out. Come find me. Watch on YouTube. We've got a really good Lenten devotion series going. I've got the Liturgy 101 series that I have to pick back up because my schedule didn't allow me to do it. And of course, there's the story of our faith and smatterings of other things. Definitely during this coronavirus uh, pandemic, definitely check out the video on communion and the common cup during the time of the coronavirus. That's an an incredible video. You should definitely check that out. But it's not my place to say what a pastor should do. I've pointed out on social media things like Luther wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God during the Black Plague. I've pointed out that Luther didn't cancel church. He brought the gospel to his people and brought the sacrament to his people throughout the Black Plague because Luther, for all his drunken little German monk faults, had a pastor's heart. Now, this has drawn some criticism from pastors, and and I understand their struggle. They have to decide what they're going to do because... Lutherans, we subscribe to what's called a two-kingdom theology, as is taught in Scripture. There is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of grace, the kingdom of Christ as king, seated at the right hand of the Father, all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. And there is the kingdom of government, which God has established for our good, to protect us from evildoers and to discipline evildoers. For the good order of creation, God has instituted government. Now, these two kingdoms are different, and they are separate. So, something like capital punishment is the responsibility of the kingdom of the government, and the forgiveness of Christ has no bearing on whether or not a government, as Paul would say, has the right to bear the sword. The the, um, office of the keys the office of the church, the office of a pastor that 
forgives sins, that administers the sacraments, that baptizes, that doesn't belong to the government. That belongs to Christ's church. That belongs to the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of grace. So what's a pastor to do? Because we are citizens of both kingdoms. I'm not here to answer that question. I'm not a pastor. But I've seen some things on social media that I find quite jarring. There was an article about uh, uh, a political leader in my home state pleading with the governor to allow Christians to gather on Sunday. He's Roman Catholic, so of course his, his, his thing is very much about the celebration of the Mass, the receiving of the Lord's Supper. And there's every, almost every single comment in that feed is about, oh, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, so I'm going to worship from home. And I, I don't want to spend the whole episode nagging, so let's talk about some positive things for a bit. On a positive note, the church has jumped on modern technology to get the word of God out to the people as they are being asked to social distance themselves, socially distance themselves. Uh, people who are tech savvy are stepping up and showing their pastors and their board of elders and their, their, their church leaders how to live stream the service. Pastors that I follow in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod are on YouTube or on Facebook and YouTube every single day live streaming matins and vespers and compline and daily devotions and they're streaming their services and they're announcing how they're going to stream their services and some pastors that I've talked to are still deciding what they're going to do. They're meeting with their board of elders to decide. And this is what I think is setting Lutherans apart. How they can continue to give their people word and sacrament. How they can pro proclaim the word of God and give them the sacrament of the altar. Because anyone who knows who they are when they read the scriptures and they see in the law of God as a mirror their own morbid reflection and they understand what Jesus says the sacrament of the altar is they run to the sacrament every Sunday every chance that they get because it is the medicine for the pandemic of sin I'm not here to say what pastors should do I'm here to talk about the bad excuse. And I've seen some pastors lamenting this excuse and going, this is going to be a problem for the church in the future. If people continue to think this way, they're going to justify not going to church when this whole thing is over. And that's really sad. Ooh, that was noisy. Sorry, I'm just I'm checking to see that the video is still recording because I don't want to lose it. I don't want to do this a third time. So the verse comes to us from Matthew 18, verse, uh, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I have heard this countless times about why I don't need to go to church. So in a previous episode, you heard me use the phrase, the pretext to every proof text is a lack of context. So we're going to put this verse back into its context. Let's go full Morpheus mode on this one here. What if I told you that this verse does not mean what you've always believed it to mean? Swallow the red pill. Let's chase this rabbit. So we're going into Matthew chapter 18. We're going to begin at verse 10, the parable of the lost sheep, because this parable is the lens through which we're going to look at everything else. So we begin at verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. So that's the lens. We're talking about seeking that which is lost, chasing after that, that one from the fold of the 99, bringing back a wayward sheep. We continue with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now I ask you, in good conscience, according to the rules of language and grammar, in the context of the parable that preceded it of the lost sheep, is Jesus talking about worship here? No, he's not talking about worship at all. He's talking about church discipline. So, as Mike Wazowski would say, put that verse back in its context or so help me. It's a, it's a new musical. <laughs> Currently playing at Monster University. <laughs> Let's put that verse back in its context. Jesus isn't talking about corporate worship here. He's not talking about the gathering together of the church. He's not talking about meeting on the Lord's day to receive his words and his sacraments. He's talking about church discipline. He's talking about what do you do? How do you chase down that one lost sheep to bring it back into the fold? And as Jesus usually does, his remedy to the problem shocks us it doesn't say oh go shower them with love tell them it's okay tell them you understand he says go and tell him his fault just between you and him and if he doesn't listen to you bring one or two others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of pay attention here two or three witnesses here's the use of the phrase two or three if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be, let's just simplify this, let's put it in layman's terms, let him be excommunicated. Kick his butt out of the church. And then Jesus says, how does this work? How do you have the authority to do this? Well, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven again. Let me make this clearer to you, Jesus is saying. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So by whose authority does the church have the responsibility to excommunicate that wayward sheep? By Christ's authority. Because in the context of church discipline, Jesus says, if two or three of you agree and ask my father, he will <laughs> do for you what you ask. Now, I suppose a prosperity gospel preacher could quote just that verse alone. If two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. So... Gather up, ye prayer warriors. Let's go to the ocean and sing praise songs to a hurricane because wherever two or three of us, whatever we ask in Jesus' name, the Father will do it for us. Let's, let's declare kingdom authority over the coronavirus. I, I shit you not. <laughs> there are Christians who have tried that. So you see what happens when we rip a verse out of its context. Likewise with verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that when you come together as a body of believers for the sole purpose of bringing back a lost sheep, there I am among you. And whatever you ask in regards to bringing back this wayward sheep, my father will grant. Why? Because to you, to the church, I grant the authority to bind and to loose on earth. And Jesus makes this abundantly clear for us in John chapter 20, after the resurrection. 
After he rose from the dead, we start in verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first week of the day, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. What is Jesus saying? He's saying to you, to you whom I am sending out, to you I give this special breath of the Holy Spirit and give the authority to bind and to loose. This is why when we are in a Lutheran church, if you're visiting a Lutheran church and you've never been there and you've heard us make confession of our sins, the pastor says, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, declare the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By whose authority? By Jesus' authority. He says that. Jesus' forgiveness is given through the mouth of the pastors. Jesus said when he sent out the 70, if they hear it from you, they have heard it from me. So if we're going to talk about social distancing, if we're going to talk about what the church should do during this coronavirus, I can honestly say I don't have the answer. I do know that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should always be proclaimed. In Jesus name the Bible says that we should be prepa prepared to preach the word in season and out of season whatever the circumstances whether it be earthquakes or wars or rumors of wars or plagues or famine or bloodshed it doesn't matter even in times of prosperity preach ye the word so while pastors nationwide in the United States are gathering together to decide how to best serve their people The verse in question, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, is not an excuse to skip church. Now, I actually said on Facebook that this is not an excuse, it's, or the, that uh, Jesus saying, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'm with them, that that's a, a, a word of comfort, not an excuse to skip church. And, and I was corrected on that by a faithful shepherd of Christ's sheep. A pastor said, incorrect, Ryan. And I asked him, would you please expand on that? And he explained to me, go back, read the passages beforehand. This is not about corporate worship. This is about church discipline. And sure enough, I got home from work. I opened my Bible. I read the word. And it was as plain as the big stupid Italian nose on my face that Jesus was in no way, shape, or form talking about corporate worship. So while I don't have the answers for pastors and what they should be doing to shepherd their sheep while the kingdom of the government is encouraging us to socially distance ourselves, I can say they are keenly aware of the fact that they have an obligation, a call, a mandate from Christ himself to preach the word, law and gospel, and to administer his sacraments. And that weighs heavily on them. I can also say that I'm very disappointed in my own church body for their decision to cancel church. And they are doing everything that they can to proclaim the word to the people. Live streaming sermons, putting out extra devotionals, recording sermons for the Lenten services, making all of this, as much as they can make available, available to the people. Fortunately, thankfully, in my area, there is a church, the church attached to my son's school where the pastor has come out and said, during the Black Plague, Martin Luther still gave to his people the sacrament of the altar, and so too shall I, for I've been commanded by God to do this. Now, what's going to happen when I go to church on Sunday? I'm not going to be in the sanctuary. I'm going to be in one of the many classrooms with no more than nine other people. And the service itself is going to be live-streamed into each room 
And then, when it's time to receive the sacrament, one room at a time, single file, in reverent quietness, we will proceed to the altar of the Lord in groups of ten, distancing ourselves by six feet from each people, each person, to receive the sacrament of the altar. So if you're a Lutheran pastor and you have not yet decided what you're going to do, this is my suggestion. Utilize your facility to the best of your ability to keep people socially distanced by six feet in groups of no more than ten and allow them ten at a time to receive the sacrament. So I don't have all of the answers, but I I just needed to talk about that verse because if we allow that verse to be interpreted the way it's being interpreted now during this pandemic where we're being asked to social distance ourselves, and people might actually have great reasons of conscience for not going to church, if we continue to let this verse be preached out of its context, what is going to bring them back to church when the pandemic ends? And it will end. And the question is, when so many people got used to alternative means of worshiping, what is going to drive them back to the pews? Here's what should drive you back. Read the law of God. See it as a guide, as a curb, and as a mirror. And when, as a mirror, it shows you how woefully short you fall of God's standard and how desperately you deserve, not how desperately, but how decidedly you deserve death and hell. And you read in the gospel that Jesus has paid the price for your sins. He is the propitiation for your sin. And he has instituted his last will and testament to be that you should eat his flesh and drink his blood for the forgiveness of the sins that burden your conscience, run to the altar. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade.